If you can't preach after that, there's something wrong. <laughs> wow. Thank you, Bethany. We are honored to have the Sonder Guards as part of our mission family with Northwest Baptist Missions. It's an honor to be here with these other missionaries. I uh, praise the Lord for uh, you folks here at Fellowship. It's exciting to see what God is doing here. I was a little, I was a little bitter. We tried to uh, court Brother Phil to be down our way, and uh, he chose to come up here. But I can, I can definitely see that um, his presence here is a blessing, and uh, very needful. And I praise the Lord for the Cleavers and their being here. I'll get over my bitterness. I'll work on it. My wife and I have just enjoyed so much your fellowship. Um, I've never seen a fellowship time that was so lengthy. It's, that's normal, I guess. I guess this is what you do. Wow, that is great in keeping with your name. You know, I, um, I think about all the, uh, the modern heroes that uh, young people have and even adults have. And, and, you know, a lot of them revolve around acting and sports and things like that. You know, it's kind of a sad thing. I, you know, sports heroes, they, they, um, they have their time in the sun. And then they're like uh, Joe Namath. You know, he's uh, promoting uh, Medicare now. And, uh, or some other hygiene products, you know, and things like that. I think, oh, what a sad way to end up a career. I think about some of the, uh, the pop singers. You know, and they're just names I, I don't recognize, nor do I care to recognize. They're, they're, they're like, they're, they're just going to come and go and come and go. But I'll tell you what, if you want to um, stand some heroes before your children, um, the Landeses and the Sondergaards and the Ortiz, they're the type of people that you need to put before your young people. They're the heroes. And they're the ones that are accomplishing that which will last forever. Man, just listening to uh, Brother Landis last night, he was just going on and on. I won't tell some of the stories, but, you know, I thought I had a pretty adventuresome life. And they're telling about going down the rivers and, and, and hammocks and, and just, uh, you know, on boats. And they're just in such close proximity. And I go, wow, I really thought my life was pretty exciting. And uh, I... I I have a very boring life. Um, <laughs> I was talking to Brother Phil. I said, how many people in the larger Boise area? And he said, you know, probably pretty close to uh, three-quarters of a million people right now. And, you know, you represent a very, very small fraction of that. Um, God called us to be in a little town of 400 people for 25 years. We just, just finished up a pastor. They're founding a church, starting it and then turning it over to a, a pastor. <clears throat> and it's kind of amazing to be, um, you know, in, in our county, there's, um, there's two churches, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or Marysville Baptist Church. That's all there is, your only choices. And it was quite an interesting thing to realize that probably today in Marysville, um, they have about 15% of the population of Marysville in church, in Marysville. 15%. If you had 15% of the people in the greater uh, Boise area, how many folks would you have? I think you might need to expand a little bit, uh, build your building a little bigger. But it's been an amazing thing that God did there. And there's special events such as um, Christmas programs and so on where we saw um, on a Sunday night townspeople hundred people there and um, think about this one-fourth of our town's population in church so I um, I say you know do not despise the day of small things God can do great things in small places December 31st um, 2019 more or less marked the official beginning of the um, coronavirus, which was spawned, we believe, in a lab in Wuhan. Evil people doing that, foisting that upon our world. 
And overnight, almost, it seems that people's lives changed. Uh, you know, two and a half years ago, if you went into a bank with a mask on, you'd be viewed with suspicion. <laughs> and now you're viewed with suspicion if you don't have one on. Just crazy. I've never dreamed that we would see the kinds of things that uh, we're seeing in our world right now. Changes in people's lives. And you just see so many things such as... Um, you know, violence on aircraft right now, uh, people just acting out. And uh, I think a lot of it's just pure frustration. People are frustrated with where we're at in our world. And overnight, people's lives have changed. And with the first round of COVID, it seemed like uh, we, we knew of some people out there, you know, that were affected and we so on. But it seems like with the new wave, uh, we've been affected very closely. I mean, people I have known and loved and appreciated and have been mentors to me and, and close associates have now passed on to heaven because of this disease. And it, um, it's, very, it's very raw. It's very real. And uh, I know this church has um, suffered some, some real tragedies and some difficulties in recent days. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the um, concerning missions, about the sovereignty of God, but also... Um, the fact that God would desire to take us out of our comfort zone. I think most of us have been pried out of our comfort zones uh, with this virus. And, of course, you think about some of the uh, hurricanes that have hit our, our Gulf um, states and, and uh, eastern seaboard. A lot of people lost their homes and their lives have been uh, turned upside down. They have had very comfortable lifestyles. They were very uh, set in what they were doing. And yet God turned all that upside down. And could God have prevented the coronavirus from uh, spreading worldwide? Yes, he could have. And could he control the weather patterns and, and all the things associated with that? Yes, he can obviously do that. But many times throughout history, God has allowed things to come into um, even believers' lives and into the life of a nation to remove people from their comfort zones. And it's so easy for us to fall into those comfort zones. My wife and I, I pastored the church in Marysvale, taking it from his infancy. We met, we, we bought the only operating bar in town. That's how we started the church in Marysvale, right on the highway. We paid $40,000 for half a city block and the bar. And you know, you think um, the bar, I think some of the people were imbibing a little bit too much when they built the building because the building, the original building we started with was 40 feet square, except it was 18 inches out of square in 40 feet. <laughs> and so, it, you know, it was really a piece of work. And so, you know, when we added on, we did things, you know, you just had to kind of cheat it a little bit here and there. But if you looked at the floor tiles, you went, wow, there's something wrong with this building. And it was really obvious because the lines, you know, weren't square with the walls, and it, it was really something. And we talked about, as we grew, we talked about maybe just adding on to that building, but man, I would just be putting more lipstick on the pig, and we need to get rid of it, you know. We just, so we built behind it a brand new building, and I praise the Lord, we did it in the kind of the slow route. We have a, um, some of you know Caleb McGill, associated with uh, Red Cliff Bible Camp. His dad is uh, Dick McGill. Uh, he, he's, one of, he's the head deacon there in Marysvale, but he also owns a construction company, and so he was the general. We all worked together for a couple of years, but we built the building debt-free, owe nothing. And uh, what, a, what a blessing that was. But, um, you know, we, we have our comfort zones, and many times that just, that just binds us. And I pastored that church for 25 years, and now we've got this new building. It's fabulous. I had an office, the likes of which I, I never dreamed that I would ever occupy. It was wonderful, man, beautiful, huge crown molding, uh, just, just gorgeous office, all kinds of built-in bookshelves and just a beautiful, big, nice desk. And I had nice chairs for people to come in and sit and get counsel and so on. And about the time, you know, I got a little bit comfortable with that, thinking God said, it's time to, you're, you're a church planter. This church doesn't need a church planter anymore. You need to, you need to leave. And I was pried out of my comfort zone. And uh, I, I gave up that office. Now I just sit in a chair at home and study. You know, it's my office now. And it's, uh, it's different. But I, I, I got to relish that for just a short time. But you know, God is always taking us out of our comfort zone. And, you know, plus 
When I resigned the church, my wife said, wow, I don't know what we're going to do. I mean, the church was paying us a salary, and, and all of a sudden that salary went away, and it was a pretty significant amount every month, and it just, it's gone. And you know, I'm, I'm pleased to announce that God has taken care of us. He has really taken care of us, and it's, you know, it's a little tight. But we're glad to be doing his service. We know that God is going to continue to take care of us. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing to be able to trust him. So many times when we get into our comfort zones, we just are in a state of stagnation. And so, and when God makes us uncomfortable with whatever he brings into our lives, our flesh cries out, no, I don't like this. I hate this. And some of you know, we, we still own a ranch, and, and we provided uh, horses for many years to the, um, to the youth camp. You took it back 35 years. We're involved with that. And I have um, I've started innumerable number of colts. You know, um, we raised baby horses, and we just, at one point, I don't know, we've, we've probably owned uh, well over 100 horses, but at one point on the ranch, at one time, we had 43 head of horses. A lot of babies, and we're always breaking horses and starting them. And, you know, here's a young horse, and, it, and the horse has never done much that he didn't really want to do. You know, when he wants to walk, he walks. When he wants to run, he runs. When he wants to turn, he turns. When he wants to eat, he eats. And when he wants to drink, he drinks. And he wants to lie down, and he lies down at will, changes direction whenever it suits him. And say the least, that life is pretty comfortable for this horse. He, at least he thinks so. But the day comes when all that changes. And a, a person comes along and uh, manages to put a halter on this horse and a lead rope. And all of a sudden, he's having to follow the lead of someone else and do something he's really not done before. He's always just done what he's wanted to do. But now he's being led by another and is forced to yield his will to that person. But still, the comfort zone is pretty good, and the horse can still pretty much most of the time go out and do what he wants to do. Then comes what I call the biggest day in the horse's life. That's the day he's going to learn how to carry a rider. And uh, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting to watch. Um, there, there's definitely going to be a battle of the wills in the initial, initial stages. And, and uh, you know, if you could read a horse's mind, he's going to say, wow, this is really different. And I don't like it. <laughs> I hate this. We usually use a round pen, and the horse typically, and I, you know, if it's me or somebody else, they're standing in the middle. And the horse always, at the beginning, will work the edges. It'll be right at the rail, head high, looking over the rail. What's the horse looking for? Escape. Escape from the pressure. It wants to get away. Um, we've actually got a, we got a really solid round pen. I mean, it's solid, but I have actually had, I think, two two horses go over the top, which is just like incredible feat of athleticism. I have some bends in the top of the rail to prove that that really happened. But, um, you know, the, the horse is trying to escape the pressure. It's trying to escape back into his former life that it remembered. You know, life is good. I could do what I wanted to do. I could eat and move and do it my will. But now, all of a sudden, somebody else's will is being exerted. And it's really fascinating to watch. And usually, I could, um, Brother Winchester uh, remembers I, I did one of these breaking demos at um, Antioch, California. And, and usually, if I can take a horse that I can approach... Um, just be able to approach it, never been touched, never been messed with, but just kind of a friendly sort of a horse. Typically, I could be riding it within two hours, be on his back in two hours riding it. And it's pretty dramatic to watch all the changes in the horse over that, the course of two hours. And, and it's really interesting to watch a horse kind of venture out of its comfort zone and, uh, and start to yield to the, the trainer, and then it'll, it'll retreat back. You know, it'll go out and go, oh, boy, look back here where I'm comfortable and then, little by little, the uh, horse begins to discover there's a whole new world out there that it didn't even know about before. And, and what, he, what he formerly thought was good, um, it wasn't maybe the ultimate good. And actually, the person who is exerting his will upon me, the horse, isn't half bad a person after all. And they, we, we call it connecting or hooking up. The horse will connect 
with the person in the middle. And it's really fun to watch. And then you almost can't get rid of the horse. It's, it's, it's become very attached. Let me tell you, folks, that God loves us all too much to leave us where we're at. And life is a series of growth process. He, he, God just takes us here and then here and then here and then here. And, you know, we may have a, a plateau for a time in our life, but God is ever expanding our comfort zone and growing us. And many times, uh, you know, I'm so glad that God doesn't give up, aren't you? And he patiently just keeps working with us and working with us and working with us. And he doesn't take our first refusal as the final answer. That's your final answer? <laughs> no. And God keeps kind of making us uncomfortable in order to take us to a new level. It's wonderful. So God loves us too much to let us remain where we're at. Joseph was hated by his brothers. Hated by his brothers. But, you know, even at that, life wasn't too bad because his dad, Jacob, loved him and gave him perks that the other family members didn't have. So there was a close bond between Joseph and his dad. And uh, I'm going to give you the really fast version of Joseph's life, okay? So just hang on. And you have to fill in the gaps this morning. But start, we'll start with... Um, Genesis chapter 37. Genesis 37. We're just going to uh, fast track this. Genesis 37. And uh, you know that um, he had had these dreams. And boy, the brothers were just, I mean, they were, already, they were already feeling antipathy towards him. But it just like it ignited the fire and it threw gasoline on the fire. And now they're really angry with him. And they're off by themselves. They're taking care of sheep. And his dad said, I want you to go out and check on the welfare of your brothers. Uh, they're taking the sheep, hadn't heard from them for a while. They didn't have cell phones and that kind of thing. So Joseph takes off, and uh, again, fast-tracking it here, um, Genesis 37, 17, last part of the verse. And Joseph went after his brethren, and he found them in a place called Dothan. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. Man, if you think you have a dysfunctional family... <laughs> Joseph's family was, uh, I say, just a little on the dysfunctional side here. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say, we will lie and say, Some evil beast hath devoured him. Then we shall see what will become of his dreams. They are just, they hate him. Well, we know that um, they decided against uh, killing him. One brother intervened, and they all concurred, and they ended up selling him to a bunch of Ishmaelites who were nomads going across, and they would sell wares and so on. And they, they thought, well, here's a, here's a slave. And so they took some money for him and sent him off with this, and I think bound probably. And, and we know that he, um, he ended up in um, Egypt, and he sold into slavery in Egypt. So we would look at life at first for Joseph and his dad and the relationship they had. We say, well, life was good for the boy. And then this happens with these brothers, and all of a sudden we switch gears. We go, this is bad. This is really bad. Well, he ends up in Egypt. Turn to chapter 39. In the first few verses here of chapter 39, and we read this, and, and Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's, uh, a Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian, and his master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. I like this. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him. And he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. I like the fact that it says, and the Lord was with him. And so now, you know, we started out saying, well, life is good for Joseph. Oh, it's terrible now. It's terrible. 
And now we're looking at it here in chapter 39. We go, well, maybe it's not so bad. It's not so bad. And so things were going along pretty good. And it could have been written. It could have been written that Joseph um, settled into a very comfortable lifestyle here. And his, his, his story could have read, Joseph lived this very comfortable situation all his days. He died at a ripe old age and just had a, a wonderful life. But you know, God wasn't finished. Wasn't finished with Joseph's story. And further down in this chapter, we find that Joseph is falsely accused by Potiphar's wife of trying to assault her. And uh, he is, um, well, verse 20 tells what happened as a result. Um, it says that uh, when Potiphar got home, he was informed of all this, and it came to pass uh, um, that um, he... Um, he took him, Joseph's master, and put him into the prison, as verse 20, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in prison. So we've gone from, it's good, his life's good. No, it's terrible. Well, it's not so bad. And now we're going, it's really bad. And we just kind of go back and forth. We oscillate back and forth with our uh, thoughts concerning Joseph as we look at this story. And... Um, You know, Joseph, in my way of thinking, is probably way outside his comfort zone. Way outside his comfort zone. But I'll tell you, quite frankly, he was exactly where God wanted him. With the good and the bad, as we oscillate back and forth, everything that happened in Joseph's life was God working his perfect will in his life. And, and you know, Joseph's down there, and you go, oh, God, uh, remember me, Joseph. I don't think I'm supposed to be here. I'm in this prison, and I, I really don't think I'm supposed to. That never happened. That never happened. And um, so he's in prison now, and we read in uh, verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph, just like he was when he came into Potiphar's house. But the Lord was with Joseph, and he showed him mercy, and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. And the keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because he recognized the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. So we come back and forth. You know, this is bad. This is good. This is bad. This is good. This is horrible. This is, well, maybe not too bad. Yeah, this is horrible. Well, maybe it's not so bad. You know, we just kind of go back and forth here. And so now he's in prison, but he's in charge of the prison. Well, maybe it's not so bad. It's so bad. Well, we know that in chapter 40, we're introduced to two dreamers, the butler and the baker. What these guys did to offend the Pharaoh to the point that they did, the degree that he did, that they should be thrown into prison. I don't, I don't know. But I want you to see the sovereignty of God in giving Jesus a segue through these two men into the very throne room of Pharaoh. This wouldn't have happened. So these two guys show up at prison. They're cast into there. Whatever they did, I do not know. But I want you to see the sovereignty of God in giving Joseph the contact in prison that he needed, exact contact that he needed. Well, Joseph helped these two men understand uh, troubling dreams that they had experienced. Of course, the baker was to be executed. I guess Pharaoh didn't like um, liver-flavored donuts or something. I don't know. But the butler was to be restored to his place of honor, his former position. And with the butler's dream, do you remember um, Joseph in verse 14? As the butler's going out the door, he's going to be released and put back into position. Joseph said, verse 14, think on me when it shall be well with thee and show kindness, I pray thee unto me and make mention of me unto Pharaoh and bring me out of this house. That was the parting shot. And you would think that somebody that had interpreted a dream so accurately 
And of course, he saw what happened to the baker. And now he's restored. You would think he would remember Joseph and mention him before Pharaoh. No, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. And uh, we get down to verse um, uh, 21. And he restored the chief butler into his butlership again and gave the cup to Pharaoh's hand. So he's back in his position. But he hanged the chief butler as Joseph had interpreted. Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but he forgot him. So now we're, here we are in this oscillation again. All of a sudden, this is bad again. It's really bad. And then you couple that with the first verse in the next chapter, 41. It came to pass at the end of two full years. <sighs> he forgot him for two years. He's just stuck there. And, and Joseph doesn't know if, it's, if the end is coming or if this is where he's going to spend all the years of his life in this prison. He doesn't know that. I submit to you this morning that God was just as much in the butler forgetting as he was in the butler remembering. Just as much in that process. You know, we look at the negative things that happen in our lives and go, man, where's God? He's there. He's there. What do you suppose, why do you suppose the delay? Why do you suppose it went two full years before the butler remembered? It's just a theory, folks. It's just a theory. Joseph was going to occupy the highest position under Pharaoh in the entire nation, Egyptian nation. He was probably going to need to know a little bit about the culture. He definitely was going to need to learn the language. I think he was in language school. I think he was learning about all the things he would need to learn about to be in that position. So God just said, hey, you're going to be there a couple of years. He's a, you're a fast learner. You can, you can get it all in a couple of years. So he's there. And then at the end of verse 1, chapter 41, Pharaoh dreamed. And we know the dream. Fat cows, skinny cows, fat heads of grain, lean heads of grain. And it really was disturbing to him. And you get down to verse 8 of chapter 41. It came to pass in the morning that, the, that his spirit was troubled. And he sent and he called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream, and there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. And all of a sudden, <laughs> butler man goes, I know a man. We dream dreams in prison, and they both were fulfilled perfectly. And I know a man. And Joseph's called for, and I'll tell you what, Joseph giving all credit and glory to God interprets accurately Pharaoh's dream. And it was obvious to all that Joseph was a man that was in touch with the Almighty. And that the interpretation was absolutely true. So we drop down there in chapter 41 to verse 37. It says, and the thing, the thing was good. It was good in Pharaoh's eyes. And in the eyes of all his servants, and Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according to thy word shall all the people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set thee over the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring, his signet ring off his hand, and put it upon Joseph's hand. It was the ring of authority. And arrayed him in vesture of fine linen, and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him to ride the second chariot which he had. And they cried before him, bow the knee. And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. You say, well, that's incredible. But how many times... Have we gone back and forth in the process of getting here? We go, this is bad. Well, maybe not so bad. This is terrible. Well, maybe it's not so terrible. And we've just gone back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. 
And we judge things by the circumstances that were entered at any given time. Um, but this is good beyond belief. I want you to think about it. The day before he became the ruler in, in, in Egypt, he was, he was a common prisoner. That's where he was. Stuck in this prison cell. But you see, the prison cell was just as much part of the process of Joseph becoming the second most powerful man in Egypt as any of the other things that we look at and we view as negative. It's all part of that. And do you ever see Joseph whining about his lot in life? I don't. I don't. What do, what do Christians whine about today? And man, I, I, I know this group is exempted. Yeah, I, I can't I can't make church today. Man, I got I got a bad hangnail and it's just killing me. You know, I, I broke a nail and I couldn't be seen in public, you know, with a broken nail and it's just you know, and I'm 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 being facetious here, but you know, we, we talk we, we become really over consumed with a lot of small minded stuff, folks. We really do. And you think about what Joseph went through. And I know what this church body has been through, and I, I praise the Lord for the way that you have, you have gathered around and, and helped and encouraged those that have experienced devastating loss. And it was so encouraging to be at the Northwest meeting, and I, I, I believe Northwest Baptist meeting, it was for no other reason. It was just a wonderful thing to see the Northwest Baptist uh, missions family gather around Ron Eamon. Nobody saw Kathy going to heaven just like that, just bam, gone. So, um, do you think Joseph ever envisioned himself in this position that he found himself in, in Egypt? I mean, growing up, you know, when he was at home, do you think he saw himself in that? Do you, do you think he really saw that's what was going to happen with the... Uh, the sheaves bowing down to his sheaf? I don't think so. How about when his brothers threw him into a pit out there near Dothan and ended up selling him to the Ishmael? You know, he's in this pit. He can't get out. And, you know, you, you, you get to where you, you act a little weird, you know, sometimes when you're in a place like that. So, you know, there's a lizard there in the pit, and he's going, hey, you know, Mr. Lizard, you know, someday I'm going to be a ruler in Egypt. I don't think uh, that happened. Um, do you think he was seeing himself riding around in a chariot wearing the signet ring of Pharaoh when he was cast into prison, falsely accused by Potiphar's wife? I don't think so. But every step, every step was absolutely vital in God's scheme for Joseph's life. Every step, vitally important. And God's ultimate objective was to put Joseph in a position where he could save his people from starvation and certain death. Boy, what a process, though. <laughs> now, we like the end result, don't we? But sometimes the process is really painful. It can be really difficult. So here's our young horse. This horse has no idea of the ultimate plan and really how good it will be. I've owned a few really special horses. And uh, one in particular, I'll just give you a quick bio of this horse. He was one of my colts that I raised. He was, he was half Arabian and half Morgan, and we call him Morabs. And at one point, we were probably the leading breeder of Morabs in the West. It was kind of an East Coast breed of horse, but we were probably the leading breeder of Morabs. And that's one colt. And my daughter and I rode all the time. We just loved to ride together, and we'd ride. And she'd take this colt out and just, just kind of let it run along with her horse. In fact, her horse was the mother to this horse. And just let it, and boy, I taught that horse how to jump over bushes and how to cross ravines and water and all kinds of things. And I, I finally got this horse started, and I just saw a horse that had uh, incredible potential. And I, I really had not done much in the way of... Um, uh, I knew about the sport of endurance racing. And the sanctioned races are 50 miles long. Um, 
And, you know, 50 miles, it's, it's a long time to be on a horse. But when you're going the speed that you go to compete, um, it doesn't take really that long. It's pretty amazing. So the first race I ever ran on this horse, I just took him out. I didn't know much about the sport. And almost I didn't know much about yeah, anything. So, I, you know, most of, the, most of the people, men and women that are competing are wearing leotards. That's something I never did. <laughs> and most of them had these little fancy little kind of lightweight little tiny saddles. I just wore or drove, I just rode a Western saddle. And uh, we get out there, and the first race that I ever ran was Antelope Island, you know, out on that, where the buffalo and everything are out in the middle of Great Salt Lake. And I just kind of, I don't know, it's about 50 riders, and I'm kind of in the middle, and I'm just talking to some guy. We're just talking, chatting, and they kind of they kind of had a pace horse. It's kind of like the Indianapolis 500, you know, that pace car, and it was kind of windy going out and kind of rocky, and then it opened up in the open area, and then the that horse pulled out, and man, we just took off. And I, my horse was fighting me, wanting to go. And uh, like I said, I've never really ridden an endurance race before, and never been on the island before. Uh, just I, I knew nothing. And uh, he was kind of wanting to go, so I thought, well, I'll just kind of air him out. And I said, I'll, I'll talk to you later. And and we were passing people loping, going the same direction we were, and it looked like they were going the other way. We're just, and within about three or four minutes, I'm leading this race, got all the racers behind me, and I thought, well, you know, he's got to slow down sometime. So we get to the center of the island, you're going across uh, big flat top things, dropping into canyons and up, and, you know, at the beginning, I was about halfway across one of these flat tops, and first rider would pop up behind me. Then it got to where there was nobody on top of these flat tops, and I was out by myself, and man, I'd never done this before, and I, I thought, wow. This is uh, really different, and I, I don't know where I'm going exactly. They had little orange markers, and I, I didn't want to get lost, so I finally just stopped the horse and waited for people to catch up. And uh, <laughs> they, they finally did, so I started riding with people again. And I wasn't the first guy out of the, they have a vet check every 12 and a half miles. I wasn't the first person out. So we're on the east side of the island now, and there are these big old ravines. I mean, they're just huge. They're from, I don't know, you know, here are those hats, the ones out there. And uh, this horse just had so much go, you can't believe it. And so everybody, these ravines are about, about this deep, and so people would yeah, be going along pretty fast paced. They have to drop, go into one of these, out the other side, and they keep going. And my horse did about two of those, and he goes, that's stupid. Let's just jump them, you know? So we did. And he just put his head down, you know, and jumped these things, and, and it was amazing. And we gained about 10 horse lengths every time he jumped one. There was just one after another after another. And pretty soon I'm out in front again. <laughs> wow, I don't really want to be here. You know, I kind of like people. But this horse just wanted to go. Uh, this horse was just an amazing. I, I used this horse up at camp as an illustration. But he, that horse and I, had, we put it on so many hours together. But I, uh, that horse was just amazing. And I used him as an illustration up at, the, up at the camp. We'd have him there. And we always start our, our classes up there with a illustra horse illustration of some kind. And have one of the wranglers go down and unclip his lead rope. We had them all the horses tied on the inside of the arena. And old Wrangle is his name. He would uh, he kind of back out of his parking spot and he would just wander off always down to the end of the arena. There's some grass over the end of the arena down there. He'd be down there and I'd be talking to the kids in my back. I knew what he was doing. I knew where he was without even looking. I'm talking to the kids and I go. Um, I want to, I want to use uh, my horse as an illustration. I said, uh, would you, and I motioned one of the kids, go, go get my horse. And he got loose. He's down at the end of the thing. And I'd, uh, this is so great. There are not many horses will do this. I go, Rango, get up here. And that horse would run. I mean, just from flying, come skidding to a stop right there. All right, what do you want? It was so great. And I, I said, watch his head. And I'd move a little bit, and his head would just follow me. And I said, all right, Dad, where are we going? What are we doing? You know, when you break a horse, it has no idea that you're going to end up in this kind of relationship. I mean, this horse, I could just open the trailer. This horse would just get in. He loved to go. He just loved to go. And, uh, you know, 
as I start horses, and I start a lot of them, you're after the heart of the horse. You're wanting to develop a partnership. Have you ever saw this relationship that I had with this horse? Um, he went on, by the way, I sold him to a doctor down in Prescott, Arizona, and that family campaigned him. He won at the international level. This is the backyard horse that I had. Amazing story. He's been featured in major magazines. Famous horse. And you know, you think about if a horse, if that horse had decided, I'm going to refuse, I'm going to remain in my comfort zone. That horse never would have experienced any of that. He loved what he did. He loved what he did. And I'm sure there were days when Joseph yearned for the comforts of Jacob's house, especially when he was in prison. But in the grand scheme of things, those hard times are what fitted Joseph for his service to God. And you have your comfort zone. We all do. This is my nice little life. I got my brand new church building. I got my office. I got my salary. And God, you better not be messing with it. You young people say, I got my friends, I got my phone, I've got my, uh, I got my little social group, and God, you better not be messing with it. And you older ones, I've got my house, I've got my retirement, I've got my RV, and this and that, and on it goes. This is my life. Listen, Joseph had a family, and Joseph had a life before he was sold into slavery. He had all of that. And while God took that from him for a time, he restored his family back to him. And this time, it was right. Turn to chapter 45. 45. We begin reading at the beginning here. And Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him. And he cried, cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. I mean, I don't think they had probably had an active thought about Joseph for many years. They'd just forgotten about him. He's dead. He's, he, we'll never see him again. I'm Joseph. Doth my father live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. There are some things in the Bible that are just incredible understatements. <laughs> That's one of them. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray thee. What language do you think he was speaking? What language do you think he spoke with them when they came and they bought grain? I believe the Egyptian language. And they had to have an interpreter. What language do you think he was speaking to them here? Hebrew. Hebrew. He was speaking to them in their language. And I, I cannot even imagine when it says they were troubled at his presence, what that must have looked like. I'm Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into slavery. There's a narrative that only he would know. And now, therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither, but God did send me before you to preserve life. In these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there shall be neither earing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Haste ye, go up to my father and say to him, Thus saith your son Joseph, God hath made me lord of all Egypt. Come down now unto me and tarry not. And thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen. Thou shalt be near to me, thou and thy children and thy children's children and thy flocks and thy herds and all that thou hast. And, and there I will nourish thee. For yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household and all that thou hast come to poverty. Behold, your eyes see, and, your, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin, that it is my mouth that speaketh unto you. And I believe that's the language. He's speaking in a tongue that they recognize and that they know no Egyptian would know, naturally. 
and you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and all you have seen, and you shall haste and bring down my father hither. And he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept over his neck, and moreover he kissed all of his brethren, and they wept upon and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers start talking again. They're just in stunned silence up to this point. I, I love the three verses, five, seven, and eight. You can just let your eyes fall on those pages and just look at the particular phrases, five, seven, and eight. It wasn't you. God sent me. Seven, God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity. Verse eight, but God, and he hath made me to be a father to Pharaoh. It's all about God. Let me challenge you, whatever you think, whenever you think your life is so great and you've kind of developed your own comfort zone, let me tell you something. God can make it better, and I don't care what age you are. God can make it better. In 1972, I was a, uh, I was a youth pastor in Yucca Valley, California, which is about 20, I don't know, maybe 22 miles from Palm Springs up in the high, high desert in California. And I was there with... Um, David Ennis, he was pastor. He, he's pastored for many, many years now in San Francisco, uh, Dr. David Ennis there. But at the time, he was in Yucca Valley. He had a young family, and my wife and I had just gotten married, and he, he liked to drive us down to Palm Springs once in a while for dinner. We'd go down there together with his family. And, and the favorite place to go was a place called the Hamburger Hamlet. Now, some of you oldsters here, I R one, you will remember, um, and then there's there's a couple parking spots behind the Hamburger Hamlet, one for Red Skelton, and the other for Lucille Ball. <laughs> they had their own personal parking spots at the Hamburger Hamlet in um, Palm Springs, California. And let me tell you, this place was served hamburger. These were gourmet hamburgers, and it was more than a normal person could eat. Uh, these, were, these were theme hamburgers. Amazing. But how many Christians do I know who are satisfied with a McDonald's kind of a life? I mean, you can, you can sort of call it a hamburger. You know, it kind of sort of looks like one, you know, and the, the thing's about a half inch thick, and that includes the bun, the meat and the other bun, and the two pickle chips, and like all the uh, condiments have been absorbed into the bread. It's been in a heat lamp for about three hours, and you have, to, you have to supersize the meal so that you get a drink big enough to wash the pasty thing down to get it down. This is your life in your present comfort zone. This is your life. God wants to take you to the hamburger hamlet. And when you get down there, you'll say, wow, this is a life. <laughs> I had no idea. Will there be some challenges for you getting from McDonald's to hamburger hamlet? I promise you there will be. There'll be times you go, man, what's going on here? But God is not going to drop you, and God is not going to break you. He has a grand design, and you need to simply trust him with your life. We need more missionaries, and we need more pastors out there. We're desperate. The pool has evaporated. And let me just challenge you parents with children here today. Quit trying to live your life vicariously through your children. And quit planning their life for them. You know, my Johnny's going to become a famous lawyer. And Susie's going to become a medical doctor. Listen, let's let God determine how they're going to be used. And why not instead? I think, I think the dynamic ought to be, if you're going to say anything, say, my Johnny's going to become a preacher. My Johnny's going to become a missionary. 
And my Susie's going to become a pastor's wife or a missionary, and they're going, to, they're going to be servants of God. Listen, point your kids in that direction. If God chooses to make them a doctor or a lawyer, I don't think we need too many lawyers, quite frankly. Um, <laughs> so be it. But let's point our kids in the direction of ministry. Let's reverse this backwards trend that we have. The life that I'm now living, I shared a little bit yesterday, but there weren't too many folks here yesterday compared to what's here today. The life that I'm now living is far from how I was raised in California. I mean, I was the beach guy. <laughs> we lived right in the ocean. I had my, uh, I had my plans. I figured when I graduated high school, I'd won a scholarship, Bank of America scholarship, to go to Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, California. So I figured, well, as soon as I graduate, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to race motorcycles for a couple of years. I love racing motorcycles. I'm going to race motorcycles for a couple of years. And then I'm going to uh, go to Cal Poly. I'm going to become a high school shop teacher. That's what I wanted to be. What a moron I was. <laughs> Absolute. My comfort zone was more pathetic than a warmed-over McDonald's hamburger. My comfort zone is huge now. I can't believe all the things that I'm privileged to do and the people I'm privileged to be with and the hundreds and not thousands of people that will greet me someday in heaven because of the direction that God had for my life and not the direction I had for my life. It's exciting. So I encourage you. And I, I see my comfort zone. I'm, you know, this, I'm not really, you know, to me, old age is just a number. I feel good. I feel good. And I figured I'll keep flying airplanes until I scare myself really bad. Um, but it's just a number. It's just a number. But I believe that God is going to continue growing my comfort zone. Even from this point going forward. By the way, when you get older, you don't get to practice for it. You don't get to practice for old age. You just have to deal with it, what comes along. And, uh, you know, I believe my comfort zone is going to keep growing. It's going to keep growing. It's going to keep growing until the day that I step through the gate into heaven. That's the ultimate. <laughs> and then my, my growth days are over. My worship days of full, unadulterated worship of God and being in his glorious presence. And that's what God is fitting us for through life. Ultimately, to arrive safely at heaven's shore and be there in his incredible presence. And God's fitting us for that our entire lives. And you may view change as God ripping you out of your comfort zone. You say, well, this is bad. How many times do we go back and forth to Joseph? This is bad. This is good. This is bad. This is good. God is simply expanding your comfort zone. And sometimes he makes us a little uncomfortable along the way. Deal with it. Just deal with it. How big your comfort zone grows really depends on your trust in and submission to the God of the universe. What kind of life are you satisfied with? McDonald's? I hope you'll say, I want the life that God wants for me and that he's designed for me. And maybe you're here today and you say, I see it all very clearly now. I see it all very clearly. I have been living in a pathetically small comfort zone self-generated comfort zone and it's time it's time I allowed God to expand it it's time and perhaps you're here today to say I, I am convicted I really am convicted good if God's done it I, I don't want to be the convictor but the Holy Spirit has convicted you about a, a small self-serving life I hope today that you will say, I want the big life with God. I want the big life with God. I want the expanded comfort zone. And today, here, Fellowship Baptist Church, I will 
gladly, gladly submit myself to the God of the universe. And whatever he wants, that's what I want. And perhaps you're here today, you don't know Christ. You've come in here, maybe it's the first time you've been here. You don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, this message hasn't been necessarily designed for you. And the step that you need to take is repenting of your sin, realizing that everything you've trusted in up to this point is of no avail, and coming and putting your faith and trust totally in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. He paid the entire price for your sin, past, present, future. And he wants to have you adopted into his eternal family. Today, you can make that decision. Uh, I, Pastor Jeff, Brother Cleaver, Man, I'd love to sit down with you with an open Bible and show you how you can know Christ and how you can know where you're going for sure when you die. So with that, let's pray. Father, I pray that you would stir hearts this morning. Lord, there's people here that um, undoubtedly in a crowd this large, people that um, have been kind of living the the life they thought was the ultimate. They've, they've built their own little comfort zone. And I pray that today they would recognize that they need to allow you to expand their comfort zone, grow them, and use them for your eternal glory. Lord, if there's anyone here who's never put their faith and trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior, I pray that today might be the day, might be that landmark moment when they come by faith and they trust fully in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Religion says you have to keep doing, you have to keep trying, you have to be a little more improved. We're so thankful for your word that it's not based on our merits, but totally upon the merits of Jesus and what he did for us. Lord, open anyone's heart that has never received Christ to receive him even this day. And we'll give you the glory, we'll give you the praise. And we'll thank you for working in our hearts now. In Jesus' name, amen.